day all right we'll in the streets so I'm gonna kind of try to compress it to maybe 45 minutes um, I have been active in I've been an anarchist and active in social movements for almost 30 years and I'm sure we're all familiar with the ongoing arguments around violence and anarchism on the left um, and I decided to write a book about it. I was doing a PhD. I got a, I got a doctorate in um, rhetoric, which is sort of about like meaning and how meaning is made and interacts with the world in different conditions. And I decided to kind of do my research on this topic of nonviolence and, and especially how it relates to rioting. Especially because um, when I started writing it, I was active in the Occupy movement and in Seattle, which is where I live, I was, I was around for a lot of cities. I was in Oakland, I was in New York for the first week, a lot of Wall Street. Um, I was really active in Seattle, where I lived, and we had this really incredible movement where we brought a huge number of people together. A lot of people had never been active at all before, and we, we did a lot of crazy stuff. We were holding public squares, we were blocking roads, we were doing a lot of really risky stuff and bringing a little awareness. And we, we took all these incredible risks together and had this sort of intimacy. And then the day that we lost our Occupy camp, we were, we were living on like a, a lawn on the college campus, squatting it. Um, and the day that the police finally came and drove us off, within hours, we started having these fights around this term nonviolence. And a lot of people, so I'm like in my mid 40s, a lot of people kind of older than me um, felt really like, of course you're, you're nonviolent. That's the basic thing of, of you know, being activism. Like, why would you not be nonviolent? That's crazy. And a lot of people kind of younger than me were like, what's with this word? And people act like it's this sort of magic spell. They can't even, even really say what they mean. And these fights within like a, you know, all these people we have gone through so much together, and within hours around this one word that people think they were fine, people were screaming at each other, accusing each other, calling the police on each other, and within like 12 hours, we'd like never talk to each other again. So I was like, what the fuck is it with this word that makes it so contentious, that makes it be so much harder than that? What is it in this history that causes so much fire? Um, so I set out and I, I read, I don't know, 100 books or something, and I interviewed probably 50 people. Those people who were really invested in the idea of nonviolence, like people who were nonviolence trainers, trainers of nonviolent direct action, and that kind of stuff, and people who aren't, people who are like into riots and feel like some kind of political violence is actually important for where we're at. So I tried to kind of bring those into discussion through this work. Um, I have three talks, three parts of my talk. As I said, I'll do my best to kind of crunch them a little bit. At first, I kind of talk about, I think that a lot of the ways we talk about protest. Um, and movements and taking to the streets are inherited from older movements, especially from the 60s and 70s. And of course, I'm talking really from a US centric basis, even though I spend a lot of time here. Um, but you know, that, that wave of radicalism still affects a lot how we talk about it. But the world has changed in some really fundamental ways that I don't think that language always recognizes. So the first part that I'm going to try to keep pretty short is looking at some of the ways that the world has changed that the language hasn't kept up with. Second part, I kind of look at the history of nonviolence and both the sort of power of it, like why people are attached to it and the limitations of that. And then the third part, I talked to a lot of people in riots. Um, the FBI was actually investigating the same thing I was while I was writing about it, so I didn't say like, did you riot last week? But I was asking people, so what do you think is important about riots? Like, from what you've seen, you know, what's significant? So the last part three of the talk is kind of what riot says. What's articulated by it? That is, does it work in their lives? Okay. In its 2016 report, Global Riot Control System Market, the market research firm Infinity Research Limited has some great news for investors who are thinking of putting their money into riot control technologies. By 2020, the overall riot control market in the United States is expected to reach. $2 billion, and the markets in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa are growing at even higher rates. Quote, protests, riots, and demonstrations are major issues faced by the law enforcement agencies across the world, and current 
conditions are unambiguously predicted to further generate demand for riot control systems. Ours is a time of riots, without a doubt. Still, not so long ago, protests in much of the world, particularly the US and Europe, were generally thought of as nonviolent affairs. After the intensity of 1968 and the subsequent repression of armed revolutionary groups in the US, Europe, and Latin America, nonviolence seemed to have become a cornerstone of social movement common sense. Yet the time when nonviolence can be taken for granted has quickly come to an end. What happened? What is it people say through rioting that went unsaid for so long? So the first thing that I did was I kind of looked back. I wanted to understand what's changed in the world since you know, 1968, 69, the early 70s, um, that maybe hasn't kept up in our language. I'm going to really kind of rush through this part. Um, so I looked at some of the writings from that generation. And I happened on this one. In the US, this was written in 1962. And a lot of people from that generation felt like this really like, summed up their politics, summed up what brought them into the streets, what, you know, what radical ideas they had. And it had this line that was like, I'll grab it here. No, no, for sure. Um, it had this line that's sort of like, as we were growing up, we thought America, and we thought the world was perfect places with these wonderful, beautiful ideas. And suddenly, as we saw the pictures coming from the Vietnam War, and we saw the pictures of the dogs, the police dogs attacking the black protesters in Selma, in Mississippi. We began to suspect that what we thought was this perfect world was actually in decline and some problems. And it was a sort of heartbreak from that that drove their protest. And I thought about that, like, who the fuck would say that in 2017, right? Anybody over like four years old is going to get that there are really deep fundamental fucked up things in the world. I don't think anybody, like maybe a lot of people did in 1962, think of the world as a sort of beautiful, flawless, innocent place where we kind of, and they have this sort of fall from innocence when they saw stuff. It's more like everybody gets that there's piles and piles of problems, and it's more like who they weigh, you know, is it capitalism, is it immigrants, right? It's like the analysis, but I don't think anybody has that kind of innocence, falling innocence feeling in the way that made sense in 1962. Also, I looked at the speech from Lyndon B. Johnson, who was the president <coughs> of the U.S. around that time, and he said, you know, our pro it's called the Great Society Speech. It's crazy to go and read this. He's like, if you go back, if you go and measure the greatness of our world, we're only so great as a person on the bottom of the heap, or we're only so far progressed in our history as a person at the bottom of the line. That's the president of the U.S., right? I can't imagine... Not only like Trump, I can't imagine Obama, I can't imagine like, it sounds like an anarcho communist to say that in 2017, right? It doesn't sound like the president of the United States. So this fundamental shift in the way the state presents itself, and that means also a fundamental shift in the way that we in the streets have to challenge it and respond to it. So I'm just going to go really fast through some ideas about like, the ways that's changed. Um, Their, my favorite book on how social movements work, I highly recommend it, was written back in 1976, but I think it's super important, is this book, Four Social Movements, How They Succeed, Why They Fail. And it basically says that if you're not in the channels of power, if you don't have like a cousin in parliament or whatever, you don't have a lot of money to kind of you know, influence the process, the only way that poor people and marginalized people, queer folks, people of color, um, can, can have an influence in the system is through disruption. Basically, like, capitalism relies on a, all these different systems on all these different levels to reproduce itself every day. And if we can interfere with those, if we can make ourselves an issue to be dealt with, that's the only way we have influence. These are from Black Lives Matter and you know, when people shut down the freeway for days on end. So it's interesting because a lot of the time radicals will fight over if something is reformist or revolutionary or whatever. From, the, from this point of view, it doesn't really matter. Um, what matters is your ability to enact disruption. And it's possible that maybe the system, the elites, the state can kind of give you enough, can give the people enough to sort of make them happy and calm down and go back home. It might be that the system responds with just brutal repression, you know, kills people or locks them up, terrifies them. Or sometimes the system just can't deal 
uh, falls over and you have a revolution. Yeah. The cause of all three of those is kind of the same though. It's our leverage to fuck shit up. It's our leverage to interrupt the process of reproduction, like the daily reproduction of capital is standing in the way of that. So what's happened in the neoliberal era in the last like 40, 50 years since that wave of social movements that, that still kind of haunts our memory is that the state has done really, really well in interfering with our ability to disrupt. I talk about it for like 50 pages in my book. I'm going to try to just sum up really quickly some of the ways. In the United States, of course, um, issues of people of color and you know bringing racism to the fore have been huge. Um, queer struggles have been huge. One thing that the system has done is it makes local representatives sort of look like um, it means local representatives sort of look like marginalized populations without actually necessarily giving them much power or, you know, bringing an individual over. Yeah, lots of pictures. Uh, So this is called indirect rule, where you give like token reforms and you sort of let somebody who looks like you think, you know, looks like marginalized poor people look, and you put them in front without essentially changing the system behind them, right? Indirect rule. Um, consumerism. Wages have actually gone down continually uh, since the early 70s, in the mostly Western world, but credit has been easier to get a hold of, and the kind of enslavement of people in, in poor countries has allowed cheaper consumer goods, which sort of have been used to, you know, a lot of the demands of the new left in the 60s and 70s were, kind of, were for like individual desire and that kind of thing. So a lot of that has been sort of redirected into products, a little easier to get. The role of non-governmental agencies or non-profits is what we call them in the US has been huge. A lot of the Individuals and organizations and even sort of ways of talking, symbols that were disruptive and revolutionary in the past have kind of become these organizations that are dependent on funding for groups like the Ford Foundation, which was actually started by Henry Ford, who was like a friend of Adolf Hitler. Um, and they, you know, they, they, they do good things or whatever, but they still have to be constantly kind of concerned about the funding cycle and, and the grant applications. And like, if they're a little too disruptive, is it going to be too much so they don't get the grant in time? So it ends up having a, a pressure downwards and reduces the ability to be disruptive over time. Back when I started writing this book, I, I had to talk about how police were a problem. And there's this interesting generational gap. Like in the Banlieu riots in Paris, outside of Paris about 10 years ago, four years ago, there was an interview, and like all the older folks in that neighborhood they said the reasons for the riots, well, they're like, oh, there's bad transportation, and the education system's sort of bad, and there's not that many jobs here, so the youth are really frustrated. None of them said police. When the interviewers asked, the, asked youth, like thousands of youth, it was like 90% of the youth said police, 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 that's the issue. So it's interesting that over time, the role of police has become central in the production of inequality in a way that older generations still kind of have trouble seeing, but, but you know, see it every day. So, you know, in the United States, the Black Lives Matter movement has made this really, really visible. The police are themselves a problem. It's not just a symptom of other problems. It's that the way the history of police, everything about police is itself a problem that we have to deal with. This is a Black Lives Matter march in Seattle where we should find a freeway. And that's me. The role of media has also really, really changed in ways that we kind of forget. Like, 
in 1970, there was an employee for the Pentagon that stole like 100,000 pages from the Pentagon that showed what they were actually doing in Vietnam. And he went and he put it on the front page of all these national papers. And he put it on the front page of the New York Times. And the FBI would move in and say, you can't do that tomorrow. And then they'd go to another paper and they'd publish it. And he was a hero. Chelsea Manning did exactly the same thing with Wiki. This is the WikiLeaks stuff. Um, some really important documents. Um, instrumental to actually helping start a spring and spent like 10 years in solitary confinement in military prisons and torture things. Now I think that she's out, but you know, there's a really different reception of a different perception of that. Chelsea was called a traitor, you know. This is a really amazing moment, I think, of when I think of like the power of media. I don't know about you, I get really annoyed when somebody's like, oh the media, the power of media. The thing is that really once was extremely important. So this is in fact, I think, the first integrated high school, Little Rock Central. And I want to say 1962, something like that, 1960. And what happened, there had actually been black youth who tried to go to other schools and try to integrate before who were murdered in the same area. But this was a very high profile thing where nine black students went to this previously white high school. And you can see in this picture the white students of Brown were not murdered. But the presence of this camera and the fact that this picture was going to get published in newspapers across the country is actually, I think, probably what allowed her, it, it saved her life, right? She was depending on this camera. This first, like, us seeing this is kind of what allows her to be there. She's still alive. She's like 89 or something now. Her son, in contrast, in 2003, was killed by police. And there was, like, no coverage of it, no picture. It was only a story because. She, his mother, was famous, and I found this one little story. But like another young black man being shot down by police without even really an excuse is so normal it doesn't even get covered in the media. So it's a different situation that people have to have to deal with. So basically, to kind of draw all these changes together, we talk about them more in Q and A. There's like a lot to say about them. But the way that I see it is that in 1962 and 1965, the state actually seemed tried to seem like fair. It tried to seem like it was enacting justice or something. In a way that the state in 2017, whether it's Finland or the United States, doesn't give a shit. It doesn't, the current, the form of the neoliberal state doesn't even try to be just. It doesn't try to be fair. If you go to like Donald Trump, or you go to like the Donald Trump fan, and you're like, racism isn't fair. Racism isn't fair. Like, they know. That's the point. So they're not going to like change it because you're pointing out that it's not fair. They don't care. It's not supposed to be fair. So it's a waste of our time to contest the elites and the state in terms of justice in 2017. You can talk to each other about it. You can talk to our you know, friends and whatever. Sure. But to, to contest the state and try to point out that it's not fair, it doesn't even claim to be so it's a waste of time. Instead, the neoliberal state works in terms of control and power. So that means we have to respond challenging not its fairness, but its power and its control over space. And we have to win control over spaces despite it. That's the shift that the state has gone over in this last 50 years, and that's the shift that we have to respond to in the media. Okay. Oh my gosh, I'm Okay. So the second part. Um, I really look back at the sort of history of this term nonviolence, what it comes from, what, what power it has, why people are so attached to it, and what problems it might have that a lot of us might not sort of buy into it. One thing that kind of surprised me is that, um, I don't have a picture for this one, but when I talk to people, some of the older people who just took nonviolence for granted, and would even sort of panic if you said, yeah, I don't like nonviolence. One of the things that they went back immediately was guns. They said, it's crazy to challenge the state with guns. It's got way more guns than we'll ever get. It's way better at it. It's just going to kill us all. I know I was there. And what happened, a lot of people, we don't think about this, but in the United States and a lot of parts of Europe in the, um, in the early, mid-1970s, there was really a revolutionary movement. And it actually came pretty close to, to overthrowing stuff, at least pretty destabilized stuff. And it was only stopped by a serious show of force and serious repression. In the United States, a lot of 
revolutionary leaders like Black Panther leaders, um, Latino leaders were killed and imprisoned. So a lot of people are staying for them from that. And also, you know, the FBI was going and breaking up friendships, spreading rumors that turned people against each other. It's an incredibly traumatic time where people still have never dealt with. And I know, I don't know, I don't know about friends, I know like in Germany, you know, you bring up the RAF with people, for example, it's the same. It's this thing that's never dealt with, it's the pain. And anyone who is near that doesn't want it to go through it again, right? It was horrible. And it failed. It didn't do very well. So that's one of the things that I hear from folks when they say nonviolence is immediately that fear of not returning to this crazy time when you have these sort of Maoist revolutionary cells trying to shoot it out with the cops or whatever. The interesting thing is, and I think for you guys, it's maybe somewhat obvious, like all the younger participants that I talked to, nobody was into guns. That's what everybody was old, the older folks when they said on guns, they thought about guns. Younger folks, nobody was talking about guns. And in fact, I had interviews with people where they're like, yeah, guns are kind of like a bad idea because if you have the sort of like, you know, anarchistic, dispersed power that a lot of us are fighting for. If you bring in guns, you have to have, you know, if you have a military struggle, you have to have secrecy, and you can't, secrecy is a lot different than like you have in a It's not the same as having an open discussion. Um, and it concentrates power in the, you have to have some kind of command structure for a lot of military stuff. It concentrates power in the hands of people with the guns. So it goes together with some of these like authoritarian philosophies to have like armed struggle. And a lot of people now, and sort of more other form of violence aren't interested in that kind of thing because of that effect. This is complicated. I'd love to go into this in the Q&A. There are guns coming out a lot right now in the States because things are getting crazy. But I still think that we don't, when people refuse nonviolence now, like it's not that people are saying yes to guns. They're saying yes to kind of something else. One example of that, yeah, actually, I'm going to that. So I'm going to read, well, the interesting thing is both the like riot people I talked to and the sort of smarter nonviolence people I talked to actually had exactly the same idea about what works, about why they do protests, why they take to the streets. I'm going to read a quotation from um, him who wrote that book, but I think this would apply, I think people that I talked to on all sides would agree with this way of looking at things. People power in the 20th century did not grow out of the barrel of a gun. It removed rulers who believed that violence was power by acting to dissolve the, the ruler's real source of power, the consent and the acquiescence of people they tried to subordinate. When unjust laws are no longer obeyed, when commerce stops because people no longer work, when public services no longer function, and when armies are no longer feared, the violence that governments can use no longer matters. The power to make people obey will completely disappear. That's the same mechanism that the nonviolent people are talking about, the black people are talking about. So they assume that they are sort of opposites, but actually on that point, on guns and on how this change actually happens, I heard it almost exactly the same idea. However, next part. In my book, I get into the poll tax riots in 1990 that brought down Margaret Thatcher as an interesting example. There were no guns, there were no like military, small military groups. There wasn't even like a sort of black block like the holdout sort of thing. Okay. Um, but there was this diffuse violence where all these people, like 100,000 people, were all doing a small amount of violence. Bubbling the cops as they went by, kicking over the stand. So it tore up London in a way that was obvious that everybody was pissed. And Margaret Thatcher, after 10 years of the worst neoliberal reforms, has to step down and have a reason. This is what drove her out of these riots. So that's a good example of this. And this is an image I think of when it's sort of like people, that process where people recognize that power is actually something that they've given over and something that they can take back. And that both riots and sort of effective nonviolent uh, disruption. Both of them eating at this process of showing people their own power and how to take it back. 
Okay, great. So that's all, you know, that's like everybody agreed on this stuff. But obviously there's some disagreements. So I look back on the history of nonviolence, and there's different parts of it. Um, the one that I focused on is strategic nonviolence, because it's the one that I thought actually has some really good ideas. There's a lot of nonviolence, I'll just kind of say this here, there's a lot of, in the nonviolence tradition, where sort of people are like, I just want to do what, you know, makes me feel right, or whatever, and doesn't even discuss kind of changing the world. So I'm not going to discuss that that much, but it's not even trying to have an effect. Some of, the, some of it is sort of more like a religious practice. I was more interested in the kind of nonviolence that's actually seeking to do the same kind of things that we are, right? So Gene Sharp is a really big name, maybe the biggest name in this kind of like, it was called strategic nonviolence. He wrote a series of books about how it works, in this one, the methods of nonviolent action, he comes up with like 198 methods of nonviolent action. It has like prayer and worship, it has like counterfeiting money, it has like singing and like strikes, uh, it has all this all this crazy stuff. And he basically, all of it, a lot of it is like, yeah, that's a really good idea. I think we're actually, even if somebody doesn't believe sort of the magic of nonviolence, this is really good inspiration for different things that movements do. But the funny thing is, he groups these all together, and he says, well, these are different things, but most of them fall into three categories. Either protest, or occupation, or strike, or stoppage. So, and he's like, these are essentially non-violent acts, so this is what works. That's great, and I actually think, you look back at, I think, what makes a difference where, where people get power in the world with this disruption thing, and show strikes, occupations, protests, or a lot of them. The crazy thing is, there's nothing about those that's actually nonviolent. And I think if you look back in history, when it's actually like a serious contested work struggle, work stoppage, there's always violence around that, because if somebody has a lot of their money in a, you know, in a business or something, they're not going to be happy to turn it over to labor. Or if somebody owns a building, and a bunch of problems take it over and decide it's theirs, like, they're not going to be like, well, can we, you know, they're going to fight for it. They're going to use violence. So there's a lot of inherent violence in our way of living that comes out in these struggles. So I think he's he's insane when he says that these are essentially nonviolent. They're perfectly good methods, but if you look at history, there's nothing about them that's actually nonviolent. There's another example of this. A guy, George Lakey, talked about in uh, Paris, 1968. Right? A lot of this is kind of a model of like how you do a revolution or something. And he said, it's mostly, it was a mostly nonviolent struggle. Because in the beginning you had street fights with like students and, and police, you know, bashing over their heads and whatever. But after that, you had like millions of youth and workers come out and take over the streets, and the police you know, gave up and went So it's mostly nonviolent. They didn't even try fighting anymore. It's crazy, right? Because the fighting was between the youth and the police was that they showed the conflict and it brought the people out. It was that initial, like the violence was an important part of that process. To call that mostly nonviolent, it reminds me of saying like war is mostly nonviolent. Because war is mostly people sitting around scared and bored in their homes, waiting for the things happening like 100 kilometers over that way, wondering when it's going to come there, right? But most of the time, war isn't actually actively in an explosion where we live. But it doesn't mean that war is not violent. That would be ridiculous, right? So I think that his idea is ridiculous in the same way. Finally, I'm going to share one more thing where these, you'll notice this pattern. The thing is that one thing that happens in nonviolence, when people talk about nonviolence, is they're sketchy, they're dishonest a lot of time about definitions. So with all these things, I was like, what do you mean nonviolence and violence? And notice it shifts and changes in an opportunistic way. So this book, this last one I'm going to tell you really struck me. This book just came out a few years ago, and like everybody I talked to who was sort of really into nonviolence and you know, nonviolence trainers, they're like, you have to read this book because it scientifically proves that nonviolence works better. Like, okay, I can't can't make this up, right? So and she uh, so it's Erica Chandler and Maria Stefan. Um, Erica Chandler, she still gets like on the front page of a lot of big newspapers and everything. People really listen to her a lot. And what happens is she found this data of studies of like, I don't know, 50,000 social conflicts. 
And one of the things is like, what do people want and did they kind of cheat it or not? And then she says, she looked at whether they were violent or not violent, and the nonviolent ones succeeded twice as often. Okay, so first of all, twice as often isn't like 100%, it's like 66% and 33%, but whatever, it's fine. So um, she's saying the ones that got what they wanted, most of them are nonviolent. Okay, great. I want to know what does she mean by nonviolent? People talk about this as if it's like an obvious meaning, but it's, I don't think it's obvious. So I looked in her book, and on page 13, right at the beginning, she told me, which is great, sometimes people don't tell you, she told me, she said, violent tactics, okay, thanks. Nonviolence is just the opposite of violence, so what's violence? Violence, violent tactics include bombings, shootings, kidnappings, physical sabotage, such as the destruction of infrastructure, huh, and other types of physical harm of people and property. Hmm, okay, that's a pretty wide definition, right? Infrastructure, so does that mean if I like, if I like, uh, kick over traffic coming on the street, is that, I don't know, whatever. But so, notice it includes property, harming property. So I'm like, okay, that's great. That's what she says about this means. Then, the next page, she talks about that data set that she used. And she says, I'm like, curious, is that the same definition in the data set? She says that a page later, she says, the data set requires all combatant groups to be armed, like to have guns, which is not what we heard paid together, and to have sustained a thousand deaths in battle during the course of the conflict. Awesome. That's not what she just said a page ago, right? So that's just like she's using these figures from like, you know, large scale armed conflicts where everybody has guns and a thousand people get killed to talk about turning over traffic cameras or whatever, right? So it's there's something about that. It, you know, she's super successful there. I found this thing on like page 15 as well. Um, so this is the kind of thing, a lot of times people are like, when somebody, you know, says that it's really important to be nonviolent, and I don't think it's true, like, what should I do? One of the things, just concrete advice, is really, like, notice what are they, what do they mean by these words? And don't assume, just because somebody says it's obvious, don't assume it is. It's usually not. A second thing that I think is wrong with how nonviolence gets used and talked about is um, I call it I noticed throughout the history of it I could tell you the whole history maybe I'll say that to the q and if you want but I looked at the whole history of nonviolence and um, all these times over and over there's this equivalence between what I would call riot and war as if they're the same thing and I thought about it and I think, I, have a lot, I actually think that riots are violent. I think it's kind of silly to say, oh, there's just some windows broken or closed. There's just some, a bunch of buildings burning in flames that wasn't actually violence. It sounds kind of violent to me. Like, the ones that have been around kind of feel violent, right? But maybe it's a different, maybe that's not the only thing that matters about it. So, um, so for example, if you think about war, war is violent and riots are violent. Okay, I agree to that part. But there's other differences that maybe matter. So war, this is a famous book by like, the American general in World War II, Smedley Butler. He said he wrote the book, War is a Racket. And he points out that war is organized by elites. Most people don't even know why they're fighting in a war. People are fighting kind of against their will, and they're killing other people like them. It's for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. Right? speak in this space, all this stuff. But war is not something that just happens between people. It's something organized by the people with the most power in society. As opposed to the history of riots, I look at the history of riots in the United States, there's like 4,000 reported ones, maybe it was like 10,000, and they happen for a lot of different reasons. Not all of them are good. But generally it happens, like the disruption thing that I was saying, if you don't have other ways to kind of have an influence, Right, is what we turn to. So, for example, the suffragettes who brought the vote for women 
people think now, like, oh, of course, it's just logical that women should vote, right? Well, maybe you look at that, but at the time, if you look at the newspapers in nearly every country of their period, they were synonymous with rioting. They were synonymous with, like, fighting police and breaking windows and causing, like, chaos in cities. Here's one of suffragists, like, burning stuff in front of the White House in the U.S. Um, here's a comic I found just the other day when I was looking at it. The suffragette that knew jujitsu, and she's like, come at me, and all the police were like, playing with me, right? This was the image. It wasn't like, oh, they have a really nice idea that they're sharing. It was that they're rioters. Um, like, queer liberation, again, uh, in the United States, we call it the gay liberation movement. Um, a lot of people forget that it began with riots. It began in 1966 with um, the Compton Cafeteria riot. And then, more famously, in 1969, with the Stonewall riots in New York City. This was the beginning of like the modern, like, get out of and by you, and this movement. And it was when police went into trans bars and were fucking with the queens and queens, and they were like, get the hell out, and the police could not comply, so they fought with them. They threw rocks at them in bottles, and they had a bleed, and a lot of people were arrested and hurt, and it brought national attention to it. Forced a conversation in a way that has now created movements that have led us to where we're at now. This is true story. You know, this is not like somebody saying sign my position. So, what I think is going on with this, um, this is the old, the old Tolstoy. I think I went back to Tolstoy. He's kind of a middle finger in the history of nonviolence. You had the Quakers with this religious group, and then actually the people, the abolitionists, the people who were trying to get rid of slavery, took a lot from the Quakers, especially this guy, Daniel Garrison. And then Tolstoy was really a big admirer of his, and, and kind of polished up these ideas into nonviolence. And then Gandhi actually said the main influence in his thought was Leo Tolstoy. And of course, Martin Luther King said Gandhi was his main influence. So this is kind of direct, it's actually a pretty clear line. So you can go back and read these guys. And one of the things I noticed about Tolstoy, Tolstoy is a really interesting character. He's a Christian, and he says, as a Christian, we should, you know, one should be opposed to any form of violence. And then he says, the state is violence. The state is founded on foundational violence, that's what makes it what it is. So he was an anarchist. He said, if you're a good Christian and you're opposed to violence, you have to be opposed to the existence of the state. And he said this in the time of the Tsar, so it was pretty radical stuff. And other people were getting killed for saying the same thing, right? So I'm kind of like, wow, that's pretty cheeky of Leo Tolstoy. But then the interesting thing is he has these things where he says, I have this passage that I'll just summarize to you. He says, you know, everybody hates me. Because I believe this idea in this idea of nonviolence. And the Tsar wants violence to attack the revolutionaries and get rid of them. But the revolutionaries want to use violence to get rid of the Tsar. And everybody, you know, they're, they're just the same, and they're all mad at me because I'm against, the, I'm against violence and I'm for nonviolence. But the thing is, when I, when I read this and sat with it, I was like, wait a minute. Like a page ago, you sounded just like the revolutionaries. And now you're saying they're the same as the Tsar, just because they're both mad at you for this idea that you have. So I think this is what I, this equivalence between riot and war, it pops up right when somebody's about to kind of get in trouble and put themselves at risk, and they a lot of time do this to sort of distance themselves from seeming too threatening. I can obviously get into that now, but I think that's what's going on with our feelings. So, that's, I have a lot more, but that's basically my critique of nonviolence that's sort of inconsistent in this opportunistic way to kind of put others at risk instead. The thing is, like, clearly, there's also books, you know, uh, Ward Churchill wrote a book back in the 80s called The Pacifism as Pathology. Peter Gelderloos wrote a couple books, um, How Nonviolence Protects the State and The Failure of Nonviolence. And I think they, I mean, I learned some stuff from reading them, but I think they fall short for a few reasons. But part of it is they don't admit why people are attached to nonviolence. And they don't admit that things calling itself nonviolence has been really powerful and important. 
They're just like stupid and blah, 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 blah. And it's obviously more complicated than that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. So trying to understand the power of nonviolence and the limitations, I went back and I found a really interesting part. I read a lot of Gandhi, I read a lot of MLK and some other people. I found a really interesting part in an early speech by Martin Luther King Jr. called Pilgrimage to Nonviolence. In this passage, he said something that struck me as different from the way people talk about nonviolence now. I'm going to read the whole thing. He says, it must be emphasized that nonviolent resistance is not a method for cowards. It does resist. If one uses this method because he is afraid, or merely because he lacks the instruments of violence, he is not truly nonviolent. This is why Gandhi often said that if cowardice is the only alternative to violence, it's better to fight. Okay. That sounds good. Like I said, it sounds kind of like there's something going on there. But the question I have when I read this is like, he's talking about true nonviolence versus cowardice, right? How much of a difference? And he's like, it's not just that you're afraid or something. So is it just like how you feel? Like if you're feeling courageous, then it's nonviolence, but if you're afraid, it's nonviolent. I mean it's cowardice. But then like, is it tactical like, courage is usually doing something even if you're still afraid, right? Courageous and afraid. So, how do you tell the difference? And then my, my main goal writer, it's not what I was saying, it's like I said, unfortunately, um, I'm a writing teacher. Um, and so, you know, I, I look at a lot of student papers and I sort of say, what are you getting at? And, like, oh, and I went back and I looked at this, like, it was a paper I was grading. And I couldn't believe what I saw. He says it right here. He says, you can't call yourself. Merely nonviolent because you lack the instruments of violence. So if you take out like the negatives and make it positive and you take out merely and all these little kind of sideways words, he says it right here. He says, you need the instruments of violence to be nonviolent. You need to be able to be violent before you can be nonviolent. I couldn't believe it when I came across it. I've never heard anybody say this, but I think it was obvious at the time and it slipped out of the way we think since then. So I looked at like King's writings, and again, if you want to hear examples, you can give them the QA. But this was at, he was speaking at a time where there were tons of riots happening, almost through this whole campaign, and there were riots and street fights with police and all sorts of property destruction. And he would always be talking to people. I have telegrams he wrote to the president, and he was like, you know, we can do it this way. Or we can do it my way. That's not like hypocrisy. Some people think it's hypocrisy that they're actually threatening this. But I think, you know, he really did want this to keep happening. He wanted to sort of reconcile the country. But what he was saying could only make sense if this was a very real alternative. And if he'd just come when there, none of this was happening and where there was passivity and said, I think two things should change, should change, then people would laugh at him. I have one example of this before I move on. Um, in the Occupy movement, there was this one moment. I wonder if anybody has seen, maybe you've seen this picture. This happened in a college right next to where I come from. I'm from Sacramento, California, and the next town over is Davis. And UC Davis, there was an Occupy movement, people were fighting, um, you know, people were doing occupations, all this stuff. And there was one time where people were blocking a uh, passageway, and there was like 20 students sleeping on, sitting down. And this one cop comes by with pepper spray and it's just like <laughs> spraying everybody in the face. Has anybody ever seen that? It's like one of those occupied images we always see. People need it, you know, that kind of thing. So that didn't that wasn't the end of the, the sort of the chancellor of the university then did all this crazy stuff where she was like paying Google to like hide search results. So people type like UC Davis, pepper spray students or whatever, like Google would hide it. She was like trying to pay to get like one of these kind of things. So there was this battle to get her fired. And there was this moment where she came out of the meeting and her car is like over there. And between her and the car, there was like a thousand students. She had to get her car and it's like just about nighttime. It's just getting dark. And so she's like walking through 
just walking through all the students, you know, a lot of other people that she like was responsible for getting pepper spray. She kind of gave her over with the pepper spray. So she's walking through. This moment was picked up, and then not long after that, she had to resign. She said, This was picked up by all these newspapers, by all these authors. And they're like, Look at the power of nonviolence. This proves that nonviolence is still so powerful that the students silently standing in between her and her car, but you know, when violence happened, shows like, you know, drew attention to it. And this one guy I really hate, he was supposed to be like interesting in the 70s, but now he's a terrible author. He said, he wrote this description of it, and he's just like, the students by being so completely nonviolent showed that they were totally helpless, and they were just so innocent that they didn't deserve to have this horrible thing done to them with the pepper spray. Bullshit. It's not fun to say. Like, I'm always like, if there's if she came out of a meeting and there was like a bunch of students like behind the fence, she'd be like, ha ha. Right? It was the fact that she had to walk all through this crowd in the nighttime. So all these people, they kill her. She's done horrible violence to them. And she has to sneak in between them. And every single one's like, I'm not going to kill you. Right? There was so much latent violence in that that the decision not to do it was really, really powerful. So I agree that not violence was really powerful, but only because it was like this close to them just tearing her to bits. Right? So it's the presence of violence that made the nonviolence meaningful and powerful. That's what we lose today, you know? And I think we can go back to this and if you want. I think this happens in all sorts of ways, like labor power and you know, protests, like sort of liberal protests or people holding signs or whatever. Those things work because they're threats. But they only work if there's a believable result of violence if they're not taken seriously. If we don't have the threat of actually enacting violence somewhere in the back there, then nobody cares. So I think what's happening is people are trying to kind of restore that. Okay. Part three. I'll try to make this long. It's a long day. So I tried to figure out what gets left out of nonviolence. What is it about riots and the special form of kind of anti-capitalist violence that is meaningful and important? And I, I found like seven things that I write about in my book, um, but I'll tell you about briefly about four of them that I do that I find them important. First of all, I went back to John Locke, who, if anybody, is kind of the guy who like wrote liberal capitalist ideology down. Second Treaties of Government, um, really important book. And he kind of spelled it all out. And I noticed there's one passage that a friend pointed out. It's really weird. That kind of touches on something that I think that comes into this. We don't have to read the whole thing, but basically he's talking about kind of why we need the state. And he says, you know, so we need the state and judges and court systems then. So you don't have revenge, killing, going back and forth. But he says, a thief, who I cannot harm but my appeal to the law, if he stole everything that I'm worth, I can kill the thief. When he sets on me to rob me, but with my horse or my coat. And then we kind of skip this, blah, blah, blah. Because the law permits me my own defense. There's a lot of words kind of apart from each other. If you take this piece of the other, he's saying, I can kill a thief if they take my coat and my horse in self defense. Like, when did your coat become yourself? That's kind of a joke. He doesn't say it directly, but he's basically saying it's an attack on him himself and he can kill in self defense if somebody tries to rob him of his stuff. And I have a lot of other examples in this, like Ian Raymond, who's I think the worst possible. Anything. But Anne Rand's you know, kind of capitalist apology, she has a lot of similar things. And they don't ever come out and say that your stuff is you. But they kind of imply it indirectly in a lot of passages like this. And I think it's the basis, it's in the basis 
of liberal capitalism that there's this kind of confusion in the idea of property between the stuff that you have in you and your own body and your soul or whatever. And I think, so, okay, so that's one of the things. There's this, but it's never stated directly because liberal, liberal capitalism, you know, liberal capitalism kind of tries to be a humanistic philosophy came after the kings, so it's pretending to be about human mm -hmm. dignity. And yet, it kind of confuses lives with stuff. So as I was trying to think about this, I was thinking about um, the Greek uprising at the end of 2000, which I'm sure all of you can remember. When cops went into an anarchist neighborhood, I saw here in Athens, and killed 15-year-old uh, Alexis Grigorakis. And the neighborhood, erupted, the neighborhood erupted in riots. And then I don't think anybody expected what happened next, which was the youth across Greece, high schoolers, like junior high kids, even little kids, took to the streets and, and blew up the whole country, erupted in huge riots way bigger than the um, Basically, every ATM, every police car was burned down. Every police station was like, Vandalized, uh, political headquarters. It's huge. Billions and billions of dollars of change done. Um, famously, it happened on Christmas, and I don't know how many of you remember it. There's a like, like 50 meter tall Christmas tree in the center of Athens, and people are like, You killed my sister, you can't have Christmas, and they burned it down. Right? So, one of the interesting things that I noticed about how we talked about it in the US, well, now I will see it, but People talk about this, I mean, this was like, whoa, this is a new moment. This is where things are going. But for all the billions of dollars of damage done, there wasn't another death at the time. And for all the street battles with police, people were like, crazy, like, putting cops in their heads and fist fights with whatever, there wasn't another, you know, I didn't hear of any really serious injuries or deaths. And I didn't hear that discussed. People were just like, whoa, it's so violent. And it was. It was really massively violent, but it wasn't injurious or lethal. It wasn't, it didn't aim at bodies in a crazy way. Even when people are hitting cops, you know, cops have a body on them and stuff. So I was trying to figure out what's going on with that. And I noticed I went to Greece and I was talking to people about this. And it, it became more obvious in 2010 when um, by May Day 2010, the movement had really grown. The economic crisis had gotten even worse and corruption. And so in May, there were like 200,000 people that came out onto the streets of Athens. And they were just ready to be dealt with it. And they started going out and they rioted. Everything, everything was burning and smashed. It was huge. And then something happened that hadn't happened before. A bank owner had locked two employees into a bank and so they had to work and lock their door. And somebody molotov that bank and killed the bank owner. Hadn't happened before. And my Greek anarchist friends were like, I killed those people. I was like, in the US, like, if that happened, we'd just be like, wow, that boss was nasty, right? No, my Greek anarchist friends were like, the fact that somebody was stupid enough to Molotov that bank without checking. Because usually, I didn't know this, usually when they Molotov stuff, they're like, they like, go inside and they're like, anybody here? I got Molotov. And then you hear like, Bee! like cats or, you know, I get a classroom or whatever. And they check over there, you know, get cats, some people. And they burn it down. But they don't want to see people, right? And when these two people died, the movement just quit. Everybody was like, what have we done? We have to stop. And it killed the movement. And still to this day, it's kind of recovering. But people took it really, really seriously. So that difference between respecting life and disrespecting <coughs> stuff was really, really clear to the people who were participating in this, even if it wasn't at a distance. So I think... The way these go together is that riots like this, like kind of anti-capitalist riots, they're actively performing a respect for life as they're performing like a disrespect for stuff. It's a way of calling into question that liberal, oh, they're kind of, they're kind of the same thing, right? They're kind of almost all popular. And saying, no, they're not the same thing. Fuck stuff. Lies are what matter. And it's a way of Forcing that into public, forcing people to fight about it, have conversations about it. Um, 
Um, in the Black Lives Matter march that I was in in Seattle, it was really heated, and a teacher just recently killed somebody in our city, and we're marching downtown, and right when we get to the business district, just spontaneously, I've never heard this before, somebody started chanting, and the whole crowd started joining in, like hundreds of people, Black Lives Matter, this shit doesn't. <laughs> so it's like that same idea. Or, in Baltimore, when the Black Lives, like April of, of 2015, I think, when Black Lives Matter was kind of still at its peak, um, police arrested Freddie Gray, a young black man, and, um, and some other legal charges, threw him in the back of a police van, and they did this thing that's common in Baltimore. Where they like take these really sharp trains and go really fast and smash around in the back of a police van. And when he arrived at the police station, he had a broken spine and died within a few days. There were nonviolent protests for like a week where people were like, stop killing us, you know, black lives matter, all this stuff. And nothing happened. And then finally people were just so enraged that there was an apathy about this that riots broke out. Big riots like we haven't seen in the US for like 30, 40 years. Most famously they burned down like some of the main like pharmacies and corporate businesses in our town. Then everybody was talking about it. It's all over the news, there's this huge scandal, and everybody's like, why won't the rioting and all this girl freaking out? And what people were saying in Baltimore, like graffiti on the walls and people were getting interviewed, were like, wow, it's like we care more about broken windows than broken spines. I think it was really articulate to say that, but I think in a way, that's that's that same thing. The anti-capitalist violence is saying is that like fuck stuff. What about these lives? Why is violence against this stuff like shocking and violence against Freddie Gray or Michael Brown or lives acceptable in America? You know? That's what it's saying. That's the point that it makes. I'm gonna go through um, three more things that I think riots say. They're, they're shorter than this one, this is kind of like reading. Um, I think this is from Seattle. Another thing that people, I noticed when I was interviewing people who were kind of around for riots, a lot of people use this language of, pro, of sacred and profane. They used kind of interesting religious language. And when I was trying to figure out like what was happening with that, I did some research and I'm trying to figure out what these things mean. And uh, Giorgio Gromben, the Italian philosopher, actually has a really interesting thing to say. Back in Roman law, there's actually like a legal definition for sacred and for profane. Sacred is like if you're using something you have in daily life or whatever. I like to play fun games, play fun games on my phone. And then you're like, wow, oh, Zeus is like really, Zeus is really mad at me for, I don't know, like I keep getting sick and or like, you know, I keep missing work. There are these Zeus is that, and I wonder how I can like cheer Zeus up. So I'm like, maybe Zeus wants to play some Kingdom of Mountain Valley. So I'm like, okay, everybody, don't use my phone. This is just for Zeus. I'm gonna leave my phone over here, and Zeus is gonna play for me one, and maybe he'll be nice or something, right? That's what sacred is, is when it's out of human circulation, out of use for people, and it can only be in the use of the gods. That's like the legal definition of Roman. Profane is just the opposite. Profane is like, you can't tell Zeus, like, I don't want to play this game that I like to play, play through all games and all. I'm going to take his phone and pretend like I'm going to use it. So when you're taking something that's supposed to be for the gods and you bring it back into human life where you can do what you want with it, that's profane. That's the original legal meaning of profane. So think about that as I read, I'm going to read a testimony from somebody who's involved in some of the riots in Occupy about the kind of uses that are here. As far as this violence against property, there's of course these ridiculous cases where people jump on somebody else and start beating them up for damaging for damaging property, claiming they're against violence, or they're doing violence to somebody, not even for hurting their own property, but like corporate property, you know? To me, that's just, it speaks to me about how, especially in the US, how deeply that deification, that making sacred of property, corporate property, is. And that actually, the attack on property, even if it's symbolic, 
Because obviously we're not going to like just cause enough economic damage to Wells Fargo to drive them out of business. But the willingness to actually attack corporate property is one of the biggest taboos in our culture. It's like in the Spanish Civil War, when people dug up the bodies of nuns, or when they had crucifixes and they had firing squads for the crucifixes. It's essentially what we're looking at. Symbolically, we're looking at attacking the only thing that's left that's holy and sacred in our culture, which is corporate property. It's not a surprise to me, but it's just fascinating how much people freak out about that. And it also just reinforces to me that it's actually an important statement in education. Okay, the next one, there's an interesting group in Oakland um, that call itself Occupy Patriarchy. And what they did, it was all queer folks and women, and queer and trans folks and women. And when there was a conflict with police, they would like run up to the front, and they would be like, and things got really intense in Oakland, they just didn't go there. They'd run up to the front, and they'd be like, boys, get the fuck out of here, this is women's business. And they would hold the shields, and they would fight with police as like empowerment for this was one of the moments. I can't really see well enough, but I think a lot of members of Occupy Patriarchy in this. So I was talking to some of the people, there's actually some people who are involved with like women's martial arts and queer martial arts trainings. They, they saw this as an opportunity to put into practice some of their sort of like performative politics. So I asked one of them what they thought was going on. I have a few of them that folks do that. And she said, she was at a debate where somebody said, you know, these things are violent. It's silly to say it's not violent. Of course it's violent, but it could be a good violence. She said, oh, I was like, you're totally right. It's easier to constantly think about, you guys, it's just a Starbucks window. What are you complaining about? It's not violence. What about all the violence in the world? But I don't think that's true. The real thing is that tiny folks, this is really short, tiny folks from Occupy Patriarchy with these shields, you know, whatever, we're playing with violence. We're scared all the time, and we want to be scared too, you know? We're scared of you. We're gonna tell you we're not scared of you anymore. We wanna take on feeling tough because we're constantly intimidated by the world in a gay number of ways. People are playing with it. They're experimenting, trying on being violent, but being scared, you know? Because at least anybody who's female has at least at some point in their life, even if it's not like day to day as an adult, at some point, you felt physically intimidated by people. So it's like, oh, I have in my life felt physically intimidated. What would it be like to be the one physically intimidating somebody else? And I don't think that that's a bad thing. Okay, last one. So I did not condense it. Anymore. Last one, I, I call it backlighting. Um, it goes back to that original point that I had about how this neoliberal state, we have to fight it in terms not of justice, but of control. And the neoliberal state, um, one of the things that it does is it projects it as sort of infinite. It's infinitely powerful. It knows everything, you know, like we all have old smartphones and we're all being listened to all the time. And if the state gets really mad at us, it'll just come smash us or whatever. And you can't really get away with stuff. So one of the things that riots do is they kind of, it's like, it's like you have this infinite wall in front of you and there's no way around it. And they sort of turn on the light behind it and suddenly you see that it has like edges, it has like outside. And even if it's sort of big, there's ways around it. So I call that backlighting. It's like turning on that light behind something that looks infinite and then you see that it's actually, it has edges. This is a thing from a riot in Seattle that I was told that where the, this is the chief of police decided that he was like gonna stop at CNN, and so he runs inside and then like people sort of barricade and kept him from going out. And you can see it's like the police seem like this terrifying, infinitely powerful force, and then suddenly he's like tripping over his shoes, and it looks silly, right? Definitely, it looks like this thing that suddenly was, a minute ago was all powerful, is now kind of ridiculous. So think about that when you start from last time. I would say the moment when people start fighting the state physically, when people start physicalizing their anger, start striking back at corporations, at symbols of the state, and obviously the police were like the state embodied, all of that invisible tension, 
all that violence becomes immediate and becomes visible and physical, and I don't think that's something to be underestimated. The chance to be able to physically express and feel that rage, there's not a lot of ways to do it. Because when you're in a protest and you're saying, whose streets are the streets? Whose streets are the streets? And the police in front of you, and the police behind you, and the police to your right, and to your left, they're not your streets! That's why the police are there, just to make sure they're not your streets. And that's not just in protests, that's in everyday life. The moments when we're willing to fight for the streets and take them is as close as I've ever felt to actually having the streets. It may only last five minutes, ten minutes, it may just be a few hours, but it's in that struggle, I think, that we come the closest. I don't want to say that it's the only real form of political expression. That's not what I'm saying at all. But it's a unique form of political expression that brings its own rewards, which are very different from other forms. It has its own risks, it has its own problems, just like all forms of political expression. Thanks.